You're up thousands of feet in the air, traveling maybe hundreds of knots. Eventually, you'll be at ground level on an airport traveling zero knots. How you get from here to there is called an arrival. Not all IFR flights end in an arrival procedure. Many will transition from the en route phase of the flight straight into the approach. Here's one of those approaches, the ILS to runway 1 at Washington National. National is much too busy to just clear aircraft that are coming in from all directions at high speeds for this approach. There has to be a way to manage the flow of these arriving aircraft, just as the SIDS do for departing aircraft. This is where the standard terminal arrival procedure, or STAR, comes in. Here's the CAPS-3 arrival for DCA. Notice first that a lot of the symbols, like speed and altitude restrictions and mileages, are very similar to what you find on the en route charts. Some STARs, like this one, are designed to be able to connect arriving aircraft directly onto an initial approach fix for an instrument approach. Here, the CAPS-3 arrival ends at the catcher and intersection. It's a matter of convenience that the arrival ends at Katrin, while the ILS to runway 1 has, as its first fix, the Katrin intersection. It doesn't always work out this way, but it's pretty convenient to be able to demonstrate how the arrival connects into the approach. Now let's look at the whole thing from the side. The arrival is designed to flow aircraft onto the approach course, represented by the localizer slash glide slope feather here. Let's clean up some of this to make it easier to understand. Notice that MEA and MOCA symbols are given just like on the en route charts. Don't mistake those for the altitudes you're supposed to fly on the arrival. They're just minimum altitudes for the route and are typically well below what the crossing altitudes are. Let's clear those out and make some room. Now, starting from the left, we have the waves fix, the first on this arrival. We're to arrive at this fix between flight levels 220 and 210. The 280K symbol is a speed restriction with a bar both above and below it. This means it's a mandatory speed. It's both a maximum and a minimum. We must be at 280 knots when we arrive at waves. Speed restrictions like this are usually designed to enhance the flow of traffic on the arrival. Aircraft are approaching from all different directions at different speeds, so to slot aircraft in and ensure safe separation, speeds are closely managed. The next fix is cassette. Notice the 17,000 with the bar underneath. This is a minimum altitude. So let's drop this down below to show that we need to cross cassette at or above 17,000 feet. Next, have a look at ELAP. The minimum altitude this time is 14,000 feet. So we'll drop this further down. Notice though too that there is a maximum altitude of flight level 200. So let's move this fix up there too to show that there is a sort of vertical corridor we can pass through when crossing the fix. There's also the mandatory speed of 280 knots again here. Next is bully. It also has minimums and maximum altitudes. We should cross between 13 and 16,000 feet. Notice no speed restrictions here. That 280 knot mandatory speed can be deviated from any time after the last fix. At the CAPS intersection, we once again have to be between two altitudes, 10,000 and 13,000 feet. Hoyas is next, and this time the bar above and below means it's a mandatory altitude, 9,000 feet. There's no speed restriction, but you might remember from private pilot that there is a very important general speed restriction from FAR 91-117A, which says that below 10,000 feet, all aircraft should be at 250 knots or slower. This is the first fix below 10,000, so we'll need to make sure we're slow enough before going below. Finally, after Hoyas, there are no speed or altitude restrictions. We'll continue on towards Katrin and the ILS, or receive vectors for something else. Let's clean this up even more and get a vertical picture of the arrival. The dashed lines represent our altitude restrictions. Outside the lines will be either too low or too high. But inside the lines, it's pilot's discretion how the descent is managed. Two aircraft could fly the same arrival, with one staying at a higher altitude than the other, or another flying a bit faster or slower. By the time the aircraft reach Hoyas, though, they'll all be at 9,000 feet. And start the descent down to intercept the glide slope and fly the ILS down runway 1 at National.
Let's back up a bit and start before we get to the first fix of the arrival. Like we said at the beginning, your aircraft is up very high and traveling very fast in the en route phase. In order to get ourselves stopped on the ground safely, we have a ton of energy to manage, and arrivals are a tremendous exercise in energy management. Here, our airliner starts at flight level 390 and 330 knots indicated airspeed. We'll ignore its Mach number for the purpose of this topic. We want to plan our descent very carefully so that we arrive at waves at the right airspeed and altitude. And the key to doing so is to start to configure for descent far enough out. There are many ways to calculate how far out to descend that are based on ground speed and descent angle, but a good rule of thumb for us is to take first the amount of altitude we want to lose. Here, we want to get down to flight level 210, and we're at flight level 390. This is a drop of 18,000 feet. So we multiply that by 3 to get 54,000. Let's drop the three zeros to get rid of the thousands, and it's 54 miles out that we want to start our descent planning. And keep in mind, this is just a rule of thumb, so it's never a bad idea to add more distance as a buffer to this. Whatever point we decide to start the descent phase, we call this our top of descent, or TOD. First, we'll start by slowing to our descent airspeed of, say, 320 knots, and then dropping down to the minimum altitude at waves of flight level 210. We should reach this altitude before reaching waves to give us time to then slow down to the mandatory speed of 280 knots. If we planned our descent correctly, we should be at both airspeed and altitude before reaching waves. If we miss the TOD point, one of two things or possibly both things will occur. We'll either be too high or too fast when we get to waves. Here, we've missed our top of descent point and started our deceleration too late. We start dropping down and do make our altitude of flight level 210, but we haven't left ourselves enough space to decelerate, and we busted the 280 knot speed restriction. Let's hope the controller left enough space between us and the plane in front of us. In this scenario now, we miss our TOD also, but we'll decelerate right away to the required 280 knots. This obviously eats up more distance so that by the time we start our descent, we won't be able to pass waves below the maximum altitude of flight level 220. Arrivals are a lot like riding on a roller coaster. You can either lose a lot of altitude and be fast, or slow down a lot and stay high. You can't lose altitude and airspeed together. The antidote is planning your descent far enough out. You might be thinking, wait, this is IFR. Won't the controller tell me when to descend? Well, maybe. And we'll get to the different ways ATC instructs us on arrival descent in a little bit. First, let's look at the CAPS-3 arrival in whole again. Notice that at CAPS, it forks off to the left and right. Up to now, we've only been talking about the right fork, which ends at Katrin. This is the route when Washington is landing north, in other words, when runways 1, 4, or 3, 3 are in use. If they're landing south using 1, 5, 1, 9, or 2, 2, we use this other route, which ends at the PAC intersection. Many stars will split off the routes based on the direction the airport is operating in. ATC, most likely the center controller, will typically give advance information about this so that we can plan out the full arrival. Notice the symbols on the fixes. The PAC and Katrin fixes are flyover waypoints, while the other fixes are fly-by waypoints, similar to how you'd see them on an route chart. Look also at some of these notes. This star requires the aircraft to be equipped with an RNAV with accuracy up to one nautical mile, which an IFR GPS would meet. And the Instrument Procedures Handbook also mentions that RNAV-1 stars like this require aircraft to have a certain level of automation on board. Another note mentions this star is restricted to turbojet aircraft only, so unless you're moving on to the big iron, you won't be flying the CAPS-3 arrival. So why don't we look at an arrival that pretty much any newly minted IFR pilot could theoretically do. Here's the Matty 4 arrival into beautiful Bellingham in the other Washington. Let's examine this route, starting at the beginning of it. The first fix is the Payne VOR, which we should cross no lower than 16,000 feet. Now this might be too high for most trainer aircraft, but some single-engine piston aircraft like a Cirrus or Diamond should be able to make this altitude, so this star is very much doable for those pilots. The next fix is the Everett intersection, at or above 14,000 feet. Next is the Matty intersection, and we should be no lower than 7,000 feet, 
and no faster than 250 knots, there's no minimum speed. Again, good news for our single-engine piston planes. If there were faster aircraft that were doing this arrival behind us, ATC might break us off and give us different instructions. But barring that, there's no reason why we can't fly it. After Maddie, the route splits off. This is where it depends which runway we're landing on at Bellingham. Here's the route when Bellingham is landing north on runway 34. Again, we start at Maddie, cross Belt with its speed and altitude restrictions, cross Tutby, and then expect radar vectors to the final approach for runway 34, which could look something like this. If the field is in south operations using runway 16, We'll again start at Matty and proceed to Gerd, Ukaki, and Yano before then expecting vectors, likely a near 180 to get established for that runway. So let's talk about the different ways ATC will instruct us to fly this arrival. We'd be on the en route portion of our flight, initially talking to Seattle Center, who would say, Cirrus 785 Tango Mike. Descend via the Matty 4 arrival, Bellingham is landing north. First, what do they mean by the phrase descend via? It means three things. We should follow the lateral course as it's depicted, we should follow all altitude restrictions, and we should follow all speed restrictions. In short, we should do what the arrival plate says. Understand that descend via doesn't mean descend right now. This is where our descent planning will come into play so that we're able to meet the altitude and speed restrictions on each part of the arrival. Also notice that center has given us the airport landing direction north so we know which transition to fly. If they informed us Bellingham was landing south, it would be this other transition. Here's a different initial instruction we might get from center. Sierra 785 Tango Mike cleared Matty 4 arrival, Bellingham is landing south. So what does it mean to be cleared for the arrival? It means that we'll again follow the lateral course as published, but we maintain our last assigned altitude, and don't start descending until instructed. ATC is deviating us a bit from the star as published by keeping us high. So we'll enter the procedure and remain at our last assigned altitude, 17,000 in this case. We'll pass Payne and then Everett when ATC will say, Cirrus 5 Tango Mike, descend via the arrival. We can now descend so that we pass GERD at 5,000 feet, set up for the rest of the procedure. This is normally not a problem for a light GA aircraft as we're not doing very fast speeds where we need to be worried about being high and or fast on the arrival. But being left up high like this is a pain when you're a fast mover. Let's say we're approaching pain, but we're in a TBM, a turboprop aircraft capable of higher altitudes and faster speeds. Initially, we're at flight level 200 and 310 knots indicated, and we get this instruction from Seattle. TBM 754 Tango Bravo, descend via the Matty 4 arrival, except cross Matty at and maintain 7000. Bellingham is landing north. We got the descend via instead of cleared for, but now there's an exception. We have to stay at 7000 after passing Matty instead of descending further as is published. We're using the north transition, so notice that there can be a real problem as we need to be at belt both at or above 4,000 feet and slowed to 210 knots or slower. Remember, you can't lose altitude and airspeed together. The controller has basically forced us to miss our TOD point with this exception. ATC is our friend though, and when it's time to issue the descent instruction, we hear this. TBM4 Tango Bravo, descend via the arrival, delete speed restrictions. This means we can descend and don't have to worry about blowing the maximum speed at belt of 210 knots. Just remember, we still have to stay below 250 knots below 10,000 feet though. So at some point, Seattle Center will give us a handoff. TBM 4 Tango Bravo, contact Victoria approach on 132.7. And switching to the approach frequency, we'll say, Victoria approach, TBM 754 Tango Bravo, leaving 4,000 feet, descending via the Matty 4 arrival, north transition. We've told the approach controller what altitude we're descending out of, what we've been cleared for, and if we had any other instructions besides what was published, we'd mention that too. Approach will assign us an instrument approach by saying, TBM 4 Tango Bravo, expect Arnav Yankee, runway 34. 
So that's a brief rundown of standard terminal arrival procedures. As newly minted IFR pilots, you could go pretty far without ever encountering a star, especially staying away from the big airports. But if your plan is to move up to the airlines, these arrivals will become your bread and butter. In any case, they're on the menu on the IFR test and oral check ride. If this was helpful, please click subscribe so that you could stay up to date on every new training video coming out each Tuesday and Friday and get access to posts and articles on the community page that'll take your training even further. It just takes one click and it's so worth it.